the sound of a church or chapel bell. But I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. We're in Mark chapter 15, and uh, we've been going through this gospel, really taking a good close look at the life and events uh, of Jesus and those that followed him. Um, we've been learning really a lot about what has been happening here and how it relates to us, and today is no different. We're going to see this morning as his trial, his um, execution unfolds, that though this is a great event in history, this is a very noteworthy thing that has taken place in the past. It has a lot of implications for us uh, in the modern day in which we live, uh, for us as individuals. And so we're going to take a look at that today. <clears throat> what we see here in chapter 15 as we come to our place in Scripture this morning is um, we're right in the middle now of the trials of Jesus. He's already been arrested, and at this point in the night uh, of his arrest, there's already been several trials. Last week, we went through the trial where he appeared before Annas, and then another trial before Caiaphas, the high priest. And then in verse 1 of chapter 15, it says, Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. Here you've got these guys gathering together once again. And what happened here is actually phase three or trial number three for Jesus in the very night of his arrest. And it's still very early in the morning, probably break of dawn. It says immediately in the morning. We're talking about the sun just coming up. So the first two trials that the Jewish council held were in the middle of the night, in the dark, which was illegal. They're not supposed to be holding trial at night. That was a judicial law that they had already broken. Well, to make things appear legal then, they probably should convene when it's light out. And so immediately in the morning, without wasting any more time, they gather together once again to make things look kosher. So here you've got Jesus being accused, already being found guilty in their eyes of blasphemy during those previous trials that were held illegally throughout the night, he's being found guilty of blasphemy for claiming to be the Messiah, which of course he was, so it's not actually blasphemy, but they don't think he's the Messiah, so they count that against him. And now there, according to their Jewish court of law, they found him guilty, already worthy of execution, but this is a problem because the Jews, under Roman authority, weren't allowed to execute anybody. So if they want Jesus to die, they're going to have to get the Romans to cooperate. So basically now that they've done their three trials, they're going to have to go into a Roman court of law and convince the Romans that he's done something worthy of death. So the Jews are halfway there. The Jewish high priests, the officials, the elders there, they've already accomplished their purpose, but now they need to convince a pagan audience that Jesus is also worthy of death because they can't execute him, but they want him dead, so they have to get the Romans to do it. So basically what this means for Jesus and everybody else involved, more trials. Okay, three isn't enough. And talk about speedy, right? In our culture, we're given the right to a fair and speedy trial, which oftentimes isn't so speedy, but boy... When it comes down to it, in their culture, when they wanted to do away with a man, they were willing to cut corners in order to make it happen. So they're breaking all, we saw this last week, breaking all kinds of rules, all kinds of judicial violations in order to get the job done as quickly as they could. Speedy trial, speedy trial, speedy trial immediately in the morning. Now they've got to go before the Romans and they'll have another speedy trial, actually three more. By the time all is said and done, Jesus will appear basically uh, on stage defending himself, or rather, refusing to defend himself six times over. So here, Jesus is being taken, it says, bound, led away, and delivered to Pilate. Pilate is the Roman governor. So now they're bringing this to the Roman court. 
I find it interesting that they did this immediately in the morning. Of course, the sun's just coming up, and what they've been doing in the cover of darkness has been illegal, and so they need to make this kosher. They meet in the morning, which says to me that they're, they're only really interested. Their highest priority at this point is looking right to everyone else. I mean, they're not doing it right, but they want to look like they're doing it right. They've already broken plenty of laws. Meeting at night is only one on a full list of rules that they have deliberately broken. So they need to meet at daybreak in order for the people to think that they're doing this correctly. That was our highest priority. They didn't have any fear of God at all. They didn't really care to do this right. They only wanted to follow the rules enough and in such a way that they appeared to others to be rule keepers rather than rule breakers. Sometimes that's the, the highest priority of individuals in the church, whether they be a Pharisee, whether they be a scribe or an elder or a priest or just a 2013 Christian. There's no real heart that wants to obey Christ and to follow him and to honor God's name. And there's only a, a priority to just look like we're doing that in front of each other. A very dangerous place to be, and it's a, a very easy heart to accommodate. People today in churches all across our country and the world are filled with people who have a higher priority of looking right than actually being right. It's the sad truth of Christianity. We are, so the saying goes, oftentimes wolves in sheep's clothing. It's easy to go to church. It's easy to appear righteous. Even though you may have been breaking rules all night, to come to church in the morning and give the appearance of holiness, of Christianity, of right standing with God. We can sing some songs, we can raise our hands in worship or not. We can put a little money in the box or not. We can read our Bible or not. We can do all of these things to appear to be right before men when in God's sight we are nothing but. And so this is a trap that they fell into and really catered to, approved one another for, and continually did throughout their lives convincing themselves in their own minds that they're right with God when of course they're not listen you might think that they looked good they probably fooled a lot of people into thinking that they were right right with God and and holy and and good before men but truth is they're killing God I mean what does it say about a person if they're able to follow all the rules or at least make it look like they're following all the rules when Secretly, they're killing God. It's a big sin in my book. I mean, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Killing God. And so here they are, trying to keep up appearances. They don't want to stir the crowd too much, but of course they want the crowd to come along with them. And so they're doing whatever they can to keep themselves from appearing to be guilty of anything that they have or might have done wrong. So... When it says in the end that they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, they bound him, they led him away, they delivered him. This isn't a good situation for Jesus, but I'll tell you, Jesus is opposed to none of this. He's okay being bound. He can put the cuffs on. At this point, he's okay with being led away. He's okay with being delivered. He knows what's going to happen. You remember a few weeks ago that when he was in the garden on the night of his arrest, he was actually praying against this. Right now, he's not opposed to any of it, but there was a time when he was very much opposed to it. But he prayed the issue through and found out over the course of time in his prayers that God wanted him to be arrested, found guilty, and then be executed according to God's will. And so Jesus is no longer willing to contest that. God made it clear to him that this was his plan. Jesus prayed, if there's any other way, it'd be great if we could find a different way to get this same thing accomplished through different means. God's absence of an answer or his silence on the matter was enough for Jesus to go, then this must be God's will. And so though he was opposed to it hours earlier when he was praying against it, he's no longer opposed. He willingly offers his wrists to be cuffed, so to speak, 
he willingly offers himself to be led away and delivered to the authorities. Jesus had the ability to get himself out of the situation, but he wouldn't let himself do it this time because he knew that it was God's will. Jesus wants what God wants. Jesus what wants what God wants for him more than he might want for himself. It speaks volumes to the Christian who is possessed with God's Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of Christ, the same Spirit that possessed Jesus. You know that he had the Holy Spirit. Remember at his baptism, he came up out of the water, the Spirit descended on him like a dove. So Jesus operates out of the strength of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in him is willing to submit himself to the plan of God even though it's very unappealing to Jesus as a man. And when we're filled with God's Holy Spirit, that enables you and I to live a life that is surrendered to the will of God in spite of the fact that it might not seem too appealing to you or I at the moment. We have that ability. God gives it to us through his Holy Spirit. So we see Jesus here now marching forward willingly into what was once prayed against but not answered. So now this is God's plan. He's going to do this and he subjects himself to the will of God and moves forward in it. In verse 2, Pilate now, Pilate's the governor, he's the judge, he's the official, also a military man. He's, he's in charge of officiating this entire Roman judicial process. So Pilate now is going to question Jesus. In verse 2, he asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers and says to him, It is as you say. Now, in Luke chapter 23, you can read in verse 2 where the accusation made against Jesus by the Jewish officials, they accused him of three things. Perverting the law, refusing to pay taxes to Caesar, and claiming to be king. Now, the Jewish leaders, they must have thought of those three things will for sure get Jesus in trouble. Now you remember, they found him guilty of blasphemy. The Romans could care less if Jesus is a blasphemer. They don't worship the same God that the Jews do. So if the Jews come to the Romans and say, he blasphemed, he's deserving of death, the Romans are going to go, we don't kill people for that because we could care less. So the Jews are going to have to find a way to get Jesus to be guilty in the eyes of the Romans that they would see as deserving of death. Well, three main things in the eyes of a Roman governor would be worthy of death. One, you've perverted the nation. You're speaking out against Rome. Another one, you're refusing to pay taxes to Caesar. Okay? The Roman IRS wasn't too happy with that. That was, you're dead. Okay? Another one, claiming to be king. There's no king but Caesar. Not in the eyes of a Roman man. And so the Jews have the three best accusations that they could ever think of in the eyes of a Roman official, and they bring those three charges against Jesus before the governor, Pontius Pilate. So basically, they're shouting these accusations. He's perverting the nation. He won't pay his taxes, and he teaches us not to pay taxes either. And he's claiming to be a king. That's a threat to Caesar. Take your pick, Pilate. Whichever one you want to condemn him of, it's fine with us. One, two, or all three doesn't really matter just so long as he dies because he's violated some of our rules too. So they lay these three options out before Pilate and Pilate zeroes in on one of them. It's interesting to me that Pilate ignores the taxes thing. He doesn't question Jesus about, really? You're teaching people that they shouldn't pay their taxes? Nor does he zero in on the, his take on the nation, his defaming of Roman pride. So what, do you, what kind of smack you been talking about us Romans? You talking trash about Caesar? Oh, no, 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 no. Pilate doesn't question about any of those things. He questions him about being a king. Look at what he says. He says, so are you the king of the Jews? Pilate zeroes in on this king issue. Which is interesting because you remember at this point in the night, 
what Jesus probably looked like. Do you remember that Jesus was sweating profusely as he was praying to God? The anxiety that he felt caused blood to be released into his sweat glands so that Luke says it looked like he was sweating blood. So now he's, he's wearing blood and sweat soaked clothes. The Bible says that at this point he had already been beaten and bruised by the fists of the Sanhedrin. Spit up. So this guy is covered in spit and blood and bruises. He's claiming to be king. So when Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? I think there's a bit of sarcasm in his voice. It's speculative, but I'm guessing that Pilate is looking at him and, and probably thinking in his own mind that this court case could be quickly dismissed because it's obvious you're not a king. Seriously, are you? You're the king of the Jews then, huh? And Jesus' reply is, it is as you say. Now, in our English translation, there's not as much force behind this as there is in the original language. This is Jesus saying, you got it. So you can, you can just kind of put yourself in that scene and the interchange that's going on between these two men. A question asked with complete sarcasm. So you're the king of the Jews. <laughs> and Jesus going, yeah. Yeah, I am. Spit. Blood. If you've ever seen the movie, I, I get a kick out of that part of the movie because they do a good job there where Pilate turns to Jesus and goes, are you, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus turns to him. His eye is swollen shut. He's black and blue, spit, blood, just looks like he's been through. And Jesus looks at him, weak and trembling, and he says, yes, I am. You wouldn't expect a king to look like that, would you? None of us, when we think of a king or, or some, some high-up official in the upper echelon of society, we don't think of what we would see in Jesus at that moment. I mean, already Jesus is kind of making Pilate's head spin. Asking him, are you the king of the Jews? He probably didn't expect Jesus to answer as forcefully as he did. It is as you say. What is Pilate thinking now? In verse 3 it says, And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? You can see now in his line of questioning that Pilate is just, he doesn't know what to make of all this. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. The way that Jesus is handling himself here says three things about those who do the will of God above their own. The way Jesus handles... You remember how Jesus is now... He's prayed all night in the garden that God would maybe change things up and let him pay for or forgive the sins of mankind without having to suffer the wrath of God or the brutality of man. And God says, no, this is my plan. We're going to have to go through it. And so now Jesus has surrendered himself to the will of God and he willingly allows himself to be bound and led away and delivered. Okay? He is submitting himself to the will of God whether he likes it or not. And the way the, ver these three verses here play out, it says three very distinct things about those who will do the will of God above their own. First one, those who do what God wants them to do, even when they don't want to, they get noticed. Those who are going to do the will of God, even when they don't want to, there's something, something about that person who's going to catch a lot of attention. If you notice here, it says, the chief priests accused him of many things. He's caught the attention of us, a large segment of their little group there. He is in the center of attention. You look at Jesus at this point in his trial, and it is obvious, very obvious, that Jesus is doing God's will over his own. 
Jesus is not a man who's in control. He is a man who is under control. He is doing what somebody else is telling him to do, and it's God. Nobody acts like that when they're doing what they want to do. Nobody. To do what God wants you to do in life is going to be, listen to me, if you're going to do what God wants you to do in this life, it is going to be so contrary at times to what human beings normally do or what you yourself would normally do that people are going to react. Especially because you've gone 10 or 20 or 30 years doing whatever you wanted to do and then you got saved somewhere along the way and now you're under God's control doing what he wants you to do rather than what you normally would have done. Your family's for sure going to take notice because you're way different now. What went wrong? They're going to look at you and go, you're not the... What happened to the old you? They're going to wonder where you went. People are going to notice, your friends, your co-workers. That's the way that this works. People are going to react, and I don't know how they're going to react. The Bible says that people will have different reactions to you when you start to live under God's control. We'll probably start talking, okay? Your sister is going to call your mom and go, do you know, they're weird. Yeah, they've been going to this church. I don't know what's... Your coworkers are going to start chattering. They won't go out with us on Fridays anymore. What's up? They might talk. They might complain. They do go out with us on Fridays, but they won't drink anymore. I hate it. it makes me uncomfortable. They might talk. They might complain. They might object to what you're doing. They might applaud what you're doing. Maybe they think it's a great thing. You're turning over a new leaf. You're on the right track finally they'll maybe oppose you maybe they'll praise you maybe they'll protest what you're doing but they will notice that's the bottom line I don't know how they're gonna react but I will tell you that they will notice Christians can't hide the Jesus living in them good luck if you try he's gonna make himself known if you're a Christian people will notice you cannot contain Jesus any more than you could contain a lion. So, you've got Jesus saving a soul and then making himself known through the life of that individual. And the people around them notice. We've got a verse in 1 Corinthians where it talks about God having chosen us if indeed we are the weak and the beggarly elements of the world. He's chosen us for a specific purpose, and that is to confound onlookers. So that your co-workers do look at you and go, what? Confound, that means to sort of disturb, distract, astonish your family, your neighbors, your friends, your old classmates in high school, they remember the old you. We will confound those in the world. They will notice. When a person does the will of God above their own, they get noticed. And the second thing here is, those who do the will of God are non-resistant. At least when it comes to God's will. They don't fight God's will anymore. Notice Jesus isn't fighting against God's will and making God have to arm wrestle him into obedience. This is Jesus going, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to follow his will, his plan. If you notice there, it says that Jesus answered nothing. It says that more than once. Jesus answered nothing. Could you imagine the governor, the judge, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, he's standing there, I doubt that he's ever seen a guy on trial acting like this. Typically what you would see when a guy's on trial is he's pleading his case, he's clamoring for proof of his innocence, he's trying to get himself out of trouble, he's probably using a lot of words. If you've ever noticed sometimes using too many words can get you in trouble. Jesus feels no need to use words because this is God's will, it's his will to be arrested, tried, crucified resurrected so Jesus has no problem with what's going on here even if 
It's all wrong. Everybody's breaking laws. Everybody's refusing to follow rules. But Jesus has no problem with that. He has no reason to defend himself because this is God's will. There's no resistance in him at all. One commentary says, the silence of a blameless life pleads more powerfully than any defense. Sometimes we don't really need to say anything. If we're obediently following Christ and doing what God would have us do, He has a way of defending us if He feels that we need to be defended. But sometimes, get this, sometimes God will decide that you don't need to be defended, you need to be cheated. And we'll get to this in 1 Corinthians, it's in chapter 6, let yourself be cheated. And we're like, no! Okay, then don't. But God will sometimes arrange your life in such a way that you get the short straw. And if your whole life is spent trying to never get that short straw, you just might find yourself at times actually resisting the will of God. Jesus here, you know, for all practical purposes, is getting cheated. Everybody's doing it wrong except for him, and yet he's the one on trial. And the, the thing is, is he could have gotten himself out of this, but yet he doesn't. He could have gotten some... We've seen throughout the Gospels many times where Jesus got himself out of trouble. This isn't the first time they've tried to kill him. Over and over and over again, they've tried to kill him. You can go back to, like, you go back to Luke chapter 4, and times before this and throughout. The Bible says that he'd go up to Jerusalem and they'd try to kill him. They'd pick up stones to stone him. But Jesus can't die in Jerusalem. He has to die outside of Jerusalem. I don't know if you know this, but there's a prophecy that says that Jesus, as a scapegoat, would be led outside of the camp and die outside. So if they're going to try and kill him in the city, Jesus ain't going to let that happen. And then there's a place in the Bible where they try to push him over a cliff. I don't know if you remember that one. Jesus is preaching at church, and he says some hard things, and then after church, instead of potluck, they bring him out to the edge of the, the cliff there, and they are going to try and push him over. This is Luke chapter 4, because they don't like him. And then the Bible says that they get him right up to the edge of the cliff, and Jesus, knowing that this is the wrong way for him to die because he's supposed to be lifted up in his death, not thrown down, he doesn't let it happen, and so he just walks right in the midst of them and gets away. There's another place where, of course, they pick up stones to stone him, but that was the Jewish method of execution, and Jesus was not to die at the hands of the Jews who were throwing rocks. He was to die, according to prophecy, at the hands of Gentiles, namely Romans, who would crucify him. This had to go down in, in the right way, in the right place, at the right time, the right method of execution, and all along the way, it's been the wrong place, or the wrong time, or the wrong way to die, so Jesus wouldn't let it happen. Here now, everything is lining up. They're in Jerusalem, soon to be taken out of Jerusalem, like a true scapegoat. Instead of being stoned to death, he will be crucified. Instead of being thrown down, he will be lifted up on a cross. Perfect. And so Jesus offers no resistance. True, Holy Spirit-filled Christians will not resist God's will. They're non-resistant. They are also noticeable to the people around them. Those are two of the three. The third, for those who do the will of God above their own will. Those kind of Christians are counterintuitive. Counterintuitive is a big word. That means you, you, you make you throw people off. You don't make sense to people. Did you notice in verse 5 it says, Pilate marveled. Marveled. He's just, he doesn't know what to think of Jesus. And tr true Christians who live for the will of God rather than their own, people don't know what to make of you. People can't figure you out. Because you're working according to the Holy Spirit of God, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is what gives people understanding, and people that don't have the Holy Spirit of God can't therefore understand. 
It's in 1 Corinthians 2.14. says that the natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. If you're going to live your life as a Christian who's surrendered to the will of God rather than your own, you're going to confuse a lot of people. It's just kind of the way it goes. People are going to look at you and go, why would you do that? You're going to get some of that. Why do you do the things that you... That's not how people do it. It's not that big of a deal to do such and such. Why don't you just kind of... You, it's, not, it's not a... There's nothing... It's okay. You can't... I just... I'm sorry, I'm a Christian, I don't do that. Yeah, but there's no rule against that. It's a, No, but you don't understand, I just don't do that. And I could try to explain to you why I can't do that anymore, but you're not going to understand. You ever found yourself in a position like that where you're trying to reason with somebody who doesn't get it? Why do you go to church all the time? I just do, leave me alone. For one, I'm the pastor. Why don't you go out with us anymore? I'm uncomfortable. But you were always comfortable for the first 20 years. Why can't you? I just, I can't. It, I'm not the same. I mean, I just, God, Jesus died, and then I, the, the Holy Spirit, just, never mind. I, you, you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't. You don't. God won't let you. Not until you have the Holy Spirit, too. And have you ever noticed that once you got the Holy Spirit, suddenly you started to get it. You know, like people in your life who were Christians and you never understood them, suddenly now you get it, you understand them, and you're like, ah, now this makes sense. And like, you're on that team. You're like, you're one of them. It's like, and then you, and then you if you're like me, then you get freaky because you know that once you cross over, you understand what they were doing all along, but you also know, oh, I know how people are going to look at me now. It's like you spent the first how many years of your life not filled with the Holy Spirit, not understanding Christians, thinking they were idiots, sissies, foolish, just dorks. And then all of a sudden you are them and you get why they acted like that and they were so silly or whatever because they just love Jesus. But then there's that thing in the back of your mind that goes, oh, now, now I'm the sissy. <laughs> Everybody at work's going to think that I'm the Bible thumper and they're all, oh no. But whatever, I get it now and praise God for that. I mean, I know now, I have the Holy Spirit, I have understanding. So in true Christians who surrender themselves to the will of God over their own, one, they get noticed, they're hard to avoid. Two, they're non-resistant, they're very compliant with the will of God now. And three, they're counterintuitive, they're going to baffle the people around them. And the only way to avoid all of that is to be one who says, I'm Christian, but you don't do the will of God. You do your own. That would be how you avoid ever ruffling any feathers with coworkers or family or anybody else around you. Just continue to live carnally. Live like you're not a believer. Disobey. Rebel. And then, of course, you've got to wonder if you can get away with that and you, you go along so far on that path whether you're actually a Christian or not. The Holy Spirit won't let you. The, the Holy Spirit, if you're a true child of God, if you're a son or daughter of His, He counts you as His own. He bought you with a price and you're too precious now for Him to let you get very far before He jerks you back out of disobedience and sets you back on the right path. I will not let my son go too far in rebellion against me. I know it's dangerous. I know it's foolish. And it is not good for him. And I love him too much. I will correct him. Mark my words. And God will do this for you. Read Hebrews chapter 12. It tells us this. If it's not happening, you're not his son. If it's not happening, you're not his daughter. Now, I think it's Interesting here because Jesus being on trial, you'd expect him to make a defense, right? I mean, any other guy on trial in his position would speak up for himself and go, there's a ton of illegal things happening here. First of all, I've been on trial all night. Second of all, I don't have a lawyer. Third of all, I... And he could just go on down the list, and any normal prisoner would do that. You would expect him to make a defense... You would expect him to plead his case, but Jesus doesn't do it 
Because one, he surrendered to the will of God, and two, he doesn't need to. Because there's already a plethora of very clear evidence that screams of his innocence. And if they can't see that, then he's not going to give them any more. You know I'm innocent. And I don't need to plead my case because there's already enough evidence on the table not only to clear my name, but to condemn you. And so he doesn't. He doesn't plead his case. He doesn't argue with them. He lets them continue on. And Pilate marvels at this. And I think a lot of people in 2013 would marvel at how easily Jesus will just kind of give up. He'll let you do whatever you want. In our natural minds, we expect God to just hunt us down and make us obey him, and he just is going to love us so much that he won't let us go to hell. But you might marvel when you read the Bible because actually God will let you go to hell. Well, how can a good, loving God send anybody to hell? He will. Does that make you marvel? He's not going to plead his case. There's already enough evidence on the table. Jesus said to those who wanted him to perform miracles in order for them to believe, he said, I'm not going to perform miracles. He says, you could bring somebody back from the dead and they wouldn't even believe. And Jesus comes back from the dead and still they don't believe. Jesus goes, there's plenty of evidence already. And if you can't take the evidence that's already there and believe in that, then why would I need to plead and plead and plead and defend myself and argue with you and debate with you? It ain't going to work. It's not going to work. So he doesn't defend himself. And Pilate marvels. And I think the Christian community in, in, in America right now would marvel at the truth of Scripture, which says basically Jesus will just remove his hands and fold his arms and let you go right into hell and he'll watch you every step of the way. You say, no, he loves me too much. He would lay down in the path and make me, he would make it really hard for me. Yeah, he would. And he, he has and is. But if you're, if you're insistent on walking around him or stepping over him, he's, he's going to let you. In verse 6, we kind of focus the microscope a little bit clearer on something that's going, like a, a greater detail of this whole scene, okay? We're, we're putting this text underneath a microscope on a slide, and we're kind of going to focus in now on what's going on in the life of one single man, and that's the governor, the judge, okay? Pontius Pilate, where in verse 6 it says, At the feast, the governor here, Pilate, was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whoever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. And then the multitude, crying aloud, <clears throat> began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them, releasing a prisoner. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew, he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Jesus knew this was a sh or, excuse me, Pilate knew this was a sham. He knew that Jesus was innocent. But he's pressured now. What's he going to do with Jesus? What's he going to do? Now, when we look at this, you can go, Man, he is in a nasty spot. Pontius Pilate. He didn't ask for this, did he? He didn't. Did he have any control over when he would be born? This man? No. And of all of the eras into which he could have been born, he just is so happens to be born into, you know... 32 A.D., he's a grown man. He, he could have chosen any profession. He could have grown up to be any one of a number of things, and yet he ends up being governor of any nation on the world. It happens to be Rome. Stationed in any city throughout that, it happens to be Jerusalem. And there just so happens to be Jesus the Messiah there on trial that day at Passover. God ordained for him to be in a position where he was forced, whether he liked it or not, to decide once and for all what he was going to do about Jesus. So we can look at Pilate and go, man, he got roped into a pretty sore deal. Like, talk about drawing the short straw. Wouldn't that suck? 
you're the judge, and on the docket today is Jesus versus the state. Oh, this is going to be a tough one. Okay, so now, so now we've got to look at Pilate and go, hmm, there's a bit of sympathy to be had for him because he didn't ask for this, but yet God designed it for him, and God designs this for each one of you and I. We're all in those shoes. Sooner or later, we're going to have to decide what you're going to do about Jesus. You're really given two choices here, and Pilate is giving two choices here. You can do what is right, and that, of course, is choice number one. And then choice number two is do what's wrong. What's interesting here is Pilate is going to try and dodge the responsibility of making a decision. He's going to try and postpone things or defer the passing of judgment onto somebody else. You can see a lot of parallels here between Pilate and perhaps yourself. I mean, I'm not trying to be unduly harsh for you, but sometimes when God stares us in the face and orchestrates everything in our life so that we're we're at a point where we have to choose right or wrong. We try to defer responsibility or try and postpone it. Try and plug our ears and pretend we're not in that position and just like, mm -hmm. And so what Pilate does is he finds out that Herod is in the area, and so he sends Jesus on trial to Herod. So you remember how I said the Romans are going to put him on three trials of their own, six total. Well, that would be the next one. So he goes before Herod. Herod can't find anything. He just gets rid of him, sends him back to Pilate, and so now Pilate is stuck having to make a decision what he's going to do with Jesus, and the full responsibility rests on his shoulders alone. And so what he does is he tries to make it easy on himself by kind of bringing a criminal out. You know, there's that custom, well, we get to release one, you know, every Passover. It's kind of a holiday thing. And so he brings out Barabbas and says, well, how about we just let this guy go? Because remember, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. We know that Jesus is innocent. But we also know the trouble we're going to face and the pain we'll feel if we choose rightly. I mean, if I choose what's right, I'm going to have to serve Jesus and follow him, and that's going to make things messy in my life, and that's going to make things hurt, and so I don't really want to do that. But if I choose what's wrong, oh, that's going to be bad. You know, hell is fun for no one, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and defer responsibility, pass the buck to somebody else, and if it really comes down to me, I'm going to try and make it a little easier on myself by offering, well, maybe you'd like to let this guy go, and so then I don't have to make the hard choice. And what ends up happening here is they want Barabbas to be released. I mean, you'd think that they would have chosen... Jesus. That's what Pilate was thinking. Notice he's appealing to the crowd. I'm going to let the crowd decide who to let go. You would have thought that the crowd would have been in favor of letting Jesus go because just before this there was a big parade for Jesus. He rode in on a donkey and everybody was laying down their coats and palm branches and there's like big parade for Jesus and so the crowd obviously liked this miracle working free education free health care providing guy. If I offer them to be releasing Jesus or Barabbas, they're obviously going to pick Jesus. But the Pharisees work the crowd up to insist on letting Barabbas go instead. So Pilate's like, ugh, logic doesn't work with these people. Um, logic never does. If we're going to try and use logic in making the right decision, listen, Christianity is about as illogical as it gets. So if you're going to use logic, it, it's not going to work. Faith does, but logic doesn't. So Pilate now is once again feeling the full weight of the responsibility for making this decision about what he's going to do about Jesus. It says in verse 11 there that the chief priests had stirred up the crowd so that they, he should release Barabbas to them. And then Pilate answered and said to them again, Well, when, what do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him! Now Pilate's been given the responsibility by God to make a decision with all of the information he needs to make the right decision but 
because he's a coward, he allows everybody else to weigh in on that decision. Big mistake. Big mistake. This is the decision of a lifetime. And God has given Pilate the responsibility to decide what he's going to do with Jesus. And God has given you the responsibility to decide what you're going to do with Jesus. And you would be a fool to let other people weigh in on that decision. This is a decision that God has given for you to make. This is a responsibility that God has given for you to carry. Romans 14, 12 says that each of us will give an account of himself to God, himself or herself. You stand alone before God. No one comes with you. What you're going to do about Jesus is a decision that is no one else's responsibility to make but yours. Your spouse shouldn't weigh in on the decision. Your pastor doesn't weigh in on the decision. Your coworkers, your friends your family, and certainly not the unbelieving world. And if you have allowed them to weigh in on the decision that you're going to make, you will be sorry because the world is never going to go along with what's right. They never will. Some people are so prone to allowing other people to think for them concerning their beliefs about Jesus. You know how influenced we are, or easily influenced by the world when it comes to what we believe about Christ. We let TV decide for us what we're going to believe. We let, you know, m music and culture and our heart. How you like that one? Well, I just, my heart speaks to me, you know. I just want to follow my heart. It's like, oh, bad idea. Especially since God says it's desperately wicked. So you're led by a non-entity that is desperately wicked, is what you're saying. So you do what's desperately wicked all the time. Okay, wonderful. Why well, does I just trust my gut. Guts aren't a good thing to trust in. I don't trust in guts. Guts? How about God? Guts? What? Who weighs in on the decision that you make concerning Jesus? Well, how do you know the difference between right and wrong? You're going to have to decide where you're going to get that information because it is out there and it's not in yourself and you can't trust anybody else. So I would suggest you trust a book, particularly the Bible. But you do know that there's a whole lot of holy books out there. I mean, the, the, the Muslims have theirs and then the Jews have theirs and then the Hindus have theirs and then the Christians have theirs. And if you don't know where you fall on what you believe about the Bible, you might want to figure that out because everybody's got a different opinion about Jesus. And Jesus himself knew that, asking his disciples one day, what do people say about me? They give a laundry list of answers and Jesus says, what do you think about me? Because when it comes down to it, that's what matters. What do you think? Which book are you going to trust? Which God are you going to put your faith in? This is a decision that God has ordained for you to make. In verse 14 it says, Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They're all, Crucify him! And he's like, What? What did he do? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. At that point, judgment hadn't been passed yet, and Pilate still believed that Jesus was innocent. If you noticed in verse 14, he's going, what did he do? And yet, he caves beneath the pressure of popular opinion and condemns Jesus to death in verse 15 because he wanted to gratify the crowd. He makes the worst possible decision he could have. First, he lets the crowd weigh in on his decision, and then he allows the crowd to make the decision for him. Church history, Jewish history, there's plenty of books out there about Pilate and what ensued after he had passed judgment on Christ. And you can read about it and you'll learn that Pilate, from this point on, will never experience the fullness of joy that Jesus promises to those who trust him. He'll never experience that. He'll never have the abundant life that Jesus promises to those who would follow him. In fact, Pilate is going to go on from here and kill himself. So his, his life ends with suicide. His earthly life all up until now and from here forward until the day that he ends it is filled with bitterness, 
cowardice, misery, right up to the very end, and his eternity is one of torture and anguish, all because he allowed the world to weigh in on his decision about what to do with Jesus. Isn't that crazy? You can allow peer pressure to influence you and send you to hell. Cultural beliefs are sending the masses to hell. Your family, your friends, those closest to you that you have strong ties with, because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God, because they know nothing of salvation, may in the best of intentions influence you to live as a pagan and bypass salvation. Scary, huh? Do you know that Mother Mary attempted to do this to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, attempting to pull him away from the will of God, and Jesus, thank God, wouldn't allow that? And do you know that your loved ones could do the same thing to you if you're not careful? Listen, the decision that God has given you the responsibility to make about what you will do concerning Jesus is yours alone. Yours alone. I... I caution you of doing the same thing that Pilate has done here, allowing people to weigh in on that decision. It's between you and God. Your future, your destiny, your eternity is on the line here. We cannot afford to allow others to weigh in on this. And I think of how many people like Pilate here have come this close to Jesus. I mean, Pilate, literally, he's standing right there with the Son of God by his side. And how many people have come this close to Jesus only to walk away because of peer pressure, popular opinion, and the beliefs and attitudes of other people? Guys, the decision is ours. And God hasn't left us in the dark. His scriptures teach us who Jesus is. Is everything we need to know about life and godliness. This reveals to us God himself. We're not in the dark. But you have to understand that people in the world and those around you, co-workers and yes, even family, perhaps even a spouse, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, may just be in their heart opposed to the truth of scripture and lead you astray unwittingly. But you don't get to heaven because dad was a believer. And you won't go to hell because of anybody else. You stand before God on your own two feet. The decision that Pilate had to make here was no one else's to make. And he, without going so far as to declare that he's in hell right now, wherever he is, he's there because he decided what he would do about Jesus. Too smart, but I can dance. So 
strands catch me before I hit the ground Good and evil feel the same My heart's hiding from my brain Catch me before I hit the ground Look for me inside love's lost and found Stay